What's going on everybody? Welcome back to Chud's Barbecue. My name is Bradley Robinson and today I'm going to give you my top five tips for how to make perfect Texas style big old beef ribs. Coming up! Thank you Scoveless for sponsoring this episode. These are some beef ribs. Pat them dry. When looking for beef ribs at the grocery store, there are several types of ribs you're gonna run into. First and foremost, you got the plate short ribs here. Sometimes called short plate ribs, sometimes called plate short ribs, sometimes just called dino ribs. But what you're looking for is the ones with three bones in there. That is what we cook at all the joints here in Central Texas and produce the best barbecue ribs. The next variation you might see is the beef chuck ribs, which look very similar, except they have four bones in them. They're a little bit wider, a little bit less meat, and they're just not really as fatty or as tender. That's not to say they're a bad Bad cut, but if you're going for the true Texas dino rib, the three bone plate short rib is what you're after. From there, you're gonna run into the baby back ribs of the cow, AKA beef back ribs, and that's just the bony underside of the ribeye. And as you can imagine, when they're butchering out the ribeye from a cow, they wanna maximize the amount of steak that they get. So they usually cut really close to the bone. So there's not gonna be much meat on there, but there's still plenty of meat in between the bones and they cook up real nice. You can check out my beef back rib video if you haven't seen that one already. From there, you might see some flanking cut ribs, which is basically just cut across the bone this way, nice and thin. Think about your Korean barbecue or your Colby style ribs. You'd also find these cut in individual bones or you can find them cut into individual bones and then chunked into little inches like that. Very fun to play around with. But again, if you're going for the barbecue rib, the beef short rib three bone rack is what you're after. Once you have your beef ribs, you can trim these as much or as little as you like. On the back side here, there is a big thick membrane that some people like to remove. On the top here, there's a fat tap, but underneath there's all this silver skin that some people like to remove as well. I've tried it both ways and I don't really notice all that much of a difference. I like to leave the membrane on because we're cooking these to tenderness and we really want that meat to stay on the bones. So when we pick it up, we can get that nice bite and the membrane is just gonna help hold them together during the cooking process. As far as the fat cap goes, it is nice to remove it because you can get better penetration of your rub into the meat. Also, the silver skin has a tendency to kind of shrink up and contract during the cooking process, which can kind of pull your meat together, giving you some really tall ribs. But at the end of the day, I like leaving the fat cap on because it's going to give you a better bark. And of course, fat is flavor. That being said, this one's already pretty scored, so I'm not too worried about it. So I'm going to leave it as is. So that is my tip number one for perfect beef ribs is choosing the right rack of ribs and not doing anything to them. Obviously, if there's something hanging off, you can trim that up. But that's why I love cooking beef ribs so much is because there's no butchery required, no trimming, and they always come out great. Moving on to tip number two is all about the rub. Now you're probably thinking here comes another pitch for just salt and pepper, keeping it simple. But on the contrary, I think beef ribs is a great time to experiment with different rubs and slathers because the meat is so similar to brisket. If you're going to have brisket on your menu, differentiating the flavor profile on your beef ribs is a great idea. Now this is beef after all, so I do like to keep it somewhat simple. You know, not going with sweet rubs or spicy rubs or anything like that. Just a nice salt pepper base is great with some really good savory flavors is usually what I'm after. This is a great time to bust out some Lowry's or some seasoning salts or whatever you have. But today I'm going to try out some of this stuff. This is the rub made by the boys up at Goldie's Barbecue in the Fort Worth region. The number one barbecue joint, according to Texas Monthly. And there's some good friends. I used to work with Lane and Jalen back at Friedman's. And I was just hanging out with them this past weekend and they sent me back with some of their rub. So I figured we'd give it a shot today because it is very similar to Chud Rub or, you know, a Lowry's pepper salt mix because it's very pepper heavy, as you can tell. But it's got some wonderful savory spices and wonderful flavors in there. So that's what we're going to go with today. As I mentioned, I like to add slathers to beef ribs as well because sometimes it's fun. Differentiate it from brisket a little bit. So what I've got here is a mix of half yellow mustard and half Frank's Red Hot. That's kind of my go-to slather because mustard is a little too pasty and hot sauce is a little too thin. So just going to grab some of this and rub it all over. Just a nice thin even coating. Folks, nothing too fancy here. And as far as slathers go, you can pretty much do whatever you like. Water, oil. But I figure if you're going to add something, you might as well add something with some flavor, even though it's not really going to come through, but just feels right. And simply enough, on we go with our rub. And honestly, you really don't need to season the membrane side. It doesn't make much of a difference, but I don't know. I always do it. Probably a waste of rub, but I think it looks better. And in case anyone does end up eating the membrane, they get some flavor with it as well. Yeah. Uh. Nice, heavy coating, folks, you know the drill. Ooh, smelling nice. And at the time of shooting this video, I know Goldie's is building a website where they're gonna be selling this stuff and shipping it to you. But in the meantime, you can pick it up at any Walmart in Texas, or you can go to the restaurant. They sell it there as well. All right, folks, nice, heavy coating. And please, don't forget the sides. Rookie move, especially on a beef rib. Looking good to me. Let's fire up the pit.
I wish someone would give me five tips about how to get this snake out of my boot. On the pit we go for tip number three, which is all about the cooking process. Like most things I cook on this offset, we're gonna start out pretty low and slow, nice and smoky at around 250 degrees, just to make sure we get some wonderful smoke and a good bark going on this piece of meat here. I'm aiming the thick end of the bones towards the fire, fat cap up, and again, we're gonna rock it at 250 for the first three, four hours, and we'll bump it up to probably around 275, maybe upwards of 300. Because of the bones, these can cook a lot faster than a brisket or something like that. So, I'll see y'all in a few hours. This video is brought to you by Skull Bliss. I mean, just look how awesome this thing is. Skull Bliss offers carved animal skulls and decor elements that you're not gonna find anywhere else. Working with skilled artisans and imaginative designers to bring you animal skull art that will become the centerpiece of any room. And have no fear, no animals were harmed just for their skull. They're all the byproduct of local Balinese agricultural industries, and these would-be waste products are turned into detailed works of art that pay respect to the animal. They offer many different skulls from ram, cow, buffalo, and longhorn, which is what this one is. This one's called White Feathers, as you can see by the design. And I gotta say, this thing has been hanging in my living room for the past few weeks, and it is a conversation starter for sure. And it's cool because it comes with a mounting hardware on the back, as well as a light. So when you plug it in, this skull glows on your wall. Pretty cool stuff. The horns come detached in a nice wood box to make sure everything stays safe during transit and slides right on, making this thing super easy to hang up. And not everyone they make is this gigantic, but you know, I had to get the longhorn, right? So cool. So if you're in the market for a beautiful, detailed, premium piece of handcrafted artwork for your home, head over to Skull Bliss dot com where you can use code chudsbbq to get 50% off your order. Again, that's skullbliss.com, link in the description to get 50% off your order using my code for yourself or as a gift. And my code is only active from today until August 31st, so move quick. Thank you, Skullbliss. Eight hours later. These beef ribs are coming off the pit and they are looking beautiful. Just look at that lovely bark on there, feeling nice, feeling tender, feeling incredibly hot. Ow. So again, these went on the pit at around 250 degrees, nice and smoky for the first three, four hours. Then I bumped it up to around 275, upward of 300, cooking a little bit hotter and faster than usual until these came up to temp and are probing nice and tender. And I gotta say, these are feeling nice and buttery. Reading about 200 degrees internal. That's how you know they're done. Feeling nice and tender. Really not much to it, folks. But now it's time to let them rest, which brings us to tip number four. Because beef ribs have these big old bones in there. I don't really think there's much of a need to wrap them during the cooking process, you know? The bones kind of act like the foil boat where they're insulating the meat from the bottom, protecting everything, yet we're still getting that nice crunchy bark on top, rendering all the exterior fat, rendering that interior fat, giving us that beautiful, nice, tender, pull-apart, smoky meat. But because they were unwrapped the entire cooking process, they are a little bit crunchy. So what I like to do is wrap them up in some paper just for the rest. And there's a bunch of different ways to go about it. You know, I know a lot of places in Texas will wrap these up in plastic wrap to really seal in all the steam and moisture. Some spots will wrap them in foil, again, to collect that steam and soften the bark. But for me, some paper with some good old fashioned Wagyu beef tallow is the most flavorful and effective way to go about it. So I'm just gonna rub some beef fat on the paper here, as well as on the meat itself. Beautiful. And then we're just gonna wrap it up. And now we're gonna let this rest at room temp for the next hour or so until this comes down to an internal temperature of around 150, 140 degrees. And then it'll be time to slice on in. After a nice long rest, let's see how these beef ribs came out, shall we? Oops, don't mind if I do. Looking real nice, nice and barky, nice and tender. You can tell just by the squish factor that these are nice and tender. And that brings us to tip number five, which is carving these. Because as you'll know, the beef rib on this side is gonna be a little bit lacking, the center one's gonna be beautiful, and the right one is also gonna be a little bit lacking because that's where it kind of tapers off. So what I like to do is try and maximize your exterior cuts. That way, no matter who you're serving these to, they all get an equally good beef rib. So instead of just going straight, straight, we may wanna cheat it a little bit this way and a little bit this way to make sure that each beef rib can stand up on its own. Not too shabby, folks. Ooh. And there we have it. Beautiful looking beef ribs, folks. Nice and tender. Nice and barky. Beautiful render on that. I mean, what's not to love about that, folks? Look at that beautiful, crispy, dark bark on there. Nice and tender. I mean, the beef rib is the king of barbecue for a reason. I gotta take a bite. Ooh. Mm. 
pull that back membrane off, bone comes out clean. One of the best bites in barbecue right there, folks. Like a little brisket burn end. Oh, it is so good. Mm. It's barky, it's smoky, it's tender, it's salty, peppery. What more do you need in life than that, folks? I mean, come on. Um. Bum, 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 bum. You know, it really is one of my favorite cooks in barbecue. Super simple. You know, you could do an overnight rest on these, but I really don't think it's all that necessary. Simple rub, six to eight hours, cooking hot and fast, beautiful bark, tender meat, nice and fatty, nice and smoky. I know it may seem like a really intimidating cook to do if you're new to the backyard barbecue pit, but it really is perfect for beginners. No. Nah. That was so good. Without further ado, I think it's time for the official taste test. Alright y'all, and that is it. That is my top five tips for how to make perfect Texas style beef ribs at home. To recap, first start off with a right rack of ribs and give it minimal trimming. Two, add some more flavors, add some more slathers, make it different than brisket. Three, start it off low and slow to get some nice smoky flavor, then bump the temps up hot and fast to make sure we get this thing cooked in a reasonable amount of time. Four, give it a paper wrap rest just to help soften up those crispy edges. And five, slice it so everybody gets a beef rib that's worthy of sitting on a Texas barbecue style plate. And if you follow these five tips, you are gonna have some beef ribs that you are going to love and please anyone you're serving them to. But that being said, if you enjoyed this video, let me know by hitting that subscribe button, drop a like on this video. If you give this recipe a try for yourself, be sure to tag me on Instagram at Chud's Barbecue. I'd love to see what y'all are cooking. Big shout out to all the Patreon members. Thank you for supporting the team Chud and allowing me to keep making all these videos. And until the next time I see you, please go cook something outside. Peace.